Hey guys, uh, welcome to our second edition of the uh, webinars that we're going to be doing with the uh, Tsunami 2s. Um, just real quick to kind of give you an uh, introduction to me. Uh, my name is George Anthony Bogotuk III. I work primarily as Soundtrack Sales Department, um, and I also help out with the uh, technical support side. Um, on the list there, you'll see 25 plus years experience in model railroading. Um, I've actually been doing this since I'm 13, so 25 plus sounds great. We won't actually reveal a number. Um, one of my biggest uh, uh, interests is prototypical operation. Uh, being around railroading and, and seeing railroading, but never actually using it and running a real locomotive myself, it's kind of fascinating being able to run a locomotive prototypically. And especially now once you've added sound, it really gives that extra element of the operational side of it. And so because of that, uh, I've been putting a lot more focus on my personal operations into utilizing the sounds and utilizing the decoders uh, to help more realistically and accurately uh, represent what we're doing. Um, and of course, as a user and modeler myself, I'm, I'm the uh, resident expert uh, primarily because uh, knowing and being familiar with railroading and, and model trains and how they work and things like that. I kind of have a, a whole plethora of knowledge on how to get the best out of the decoders. So, so that's kind of uh, my background. Um, today's agenda, what we're going to talk about is we're going to kind of review uh, what is Tsunami 2. Um, our last webinar, we kind of did some of this, so we're going to just repeat it for new guests. Uh, we'll do an overview of the Tsunami 2 diesel features. We're going to do some setup, uh, talk about how to use the decoder. Um, then we'll do some demonstrations. We'll actually operate the locomotive. So what is Tsunami 2? The Tsunami 2 is our premier uh, digital sound decoder line. This is designed for the discerning modeler. We've put a, a lot of emphasis on realism and sound accuracy. Again, going back to my experience and, and enjoyment of prototypical operations. We wanted to make sure that this decoder could realistically capture the feel of running a real locomotive. And we wanted to make sure, of course, that the sounds are accurate. Uh, this is a full featured sound decoder. We've put a lot of features into it and a lot of sounds uh, that we'll talk about here today. The biggest thing here is that there's no downloading time. Um, we've put a, a large amount of memory on the decoder so we can put a lot of the different choices onto the same decoder. Uh, the downloading processes by some of the companies that are out there take an average 30 to 45 minutes to actually download the sounds and the, the firmware, but what they don't talk about is the time it takes to turn on the computer, find the software, go through to make your sound selections. You can spend easily an hour, hour, two hours on doing this, and so by building the Tsunami 2, you'll see today that we make a couple of CV adjustments, and that way you can then uh, do that in a few minutes and then be off and running. So first off, again, with the uh, Tsunami 2, we've improved the hardware quite a bit. Um, as we talked about, a, a massive amount of memory. But we've also improved the components on board and found some uh, smaller components that give us a nice small package all the way down to the TSU 1100, which is small enough to fit in an N-scale narrow hood diesel, and then a more efficient design, so the TSU 4400, uh, which is a good uh, four amp decoder for O scale and larger. Um, really gives you that ability to have a uh, option for Tsunami 2 for any of the thing, any in between. We've also improved the hardware quite a bit. It's not running anywhere near as warm as what the original Tsunami did. So you should never have any overheating issues, anything like that. We've even taken out the heat sink in there. So it makes for a smaller design. So also we've improved over our industry leading tsunami decoders. Um, best quality sounds on the market. We do pride ourselves on getting the recordings from the real locomotives and not hiding in a field hoping to get the right sounds. Uh, one of our biggest proudest points is they are manufactured right here in the United States in our facility in Durango, Colorado. Um, there's a few uh, video tours of our facilities online that you can see um, and we can link to them uh, in the descriptions. Uh, but you'll see one of the pictures there to the left is the flying probe test uh, machine. And what this does is this tests the validity of the circuit and makes sure that the components are within tolerance. And this is uh, a really big uh, machine that we have that really helps ensure quality that you're getting a working decoder the first time. Um, and then you can see Krista, our production manager, and you can also see our uh, new facilities there. 
Um, what we've also done is we've improved on the features you know and love. Um, a lot of people really, really like the F11 braking, and we'll talk about that today. But we've taken those features and enhanced them and, and made them better and more realistic to operation. Uh, we do listen to our customers, and so this incorporates a lot of feedback from uh, customers over the years. There are also a lot of things that we have on our plate that we added in uh, using real railroader experience. Uh, we haven't had former railroaders on staff, so they intimately understand how the locomotives work and how to run your locomotives and your trains, and so we use that experience to build into uh, the Dakota product line. And then there's a lot of new interactive features and sounds. Um, it's not just a random noisemaker. It does interact together. Now, building on a strong lineage here, you're going to see this chart. And this is kind of a comparison chart between the original Tsunami and the Tsunami 2. You can find this on our website at Soundtracks.com, but it'll kind of go through, highlight some of the features and how they uh, implement with the two product lines. Um, and some of the things that we've done is improved uh, not just the, the hardware, but also the playback algorithms to give you a more realistic experience. Uh, so check that out on our website. So some of the core features, uh, one of the big things I want to hit home is we do have 16 independent sound channels. And the reason uh, that we have this is because when the locomotives are running, in the real world, all of those appliances are making sounds all together at the same time. And in some decoders that are out there, including some of our own in the past, the decoder has to have a priority list. It'll play one sound over the other. And so by adding more sound channels and having 16 independent sound channels, our decoder doesn't have to stop playing another sound to prioritize another uh, one other sound above it. For example, there's one of our competitors that will play the air compressor sound, but as soon as you turn on the bell, the air compressor goes silent because they're limited in their sound files. And then when you turn the bell off, suddenly the compressor appears again. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're giving you a full uh, experience of the, uh, the sound of that locomotive. Uh, with the new hardware, we've also been able to incorporate a reactive dynamic digital exhaust, or known as DDE, across the entire product line. Uh, this is something that's been in our steam, but now that we've got a much better motor control algorithm and internal components, we're actually able to give you a more accurate experience using our dynamic digital exhaust throughout the entire product line. And of course, as I alluded to, the Hyperdrive 2 motor control gives us a much more refined, slow speed um, control of the motor, and it's a lot more smooth than anything that we've done in the past, and better than most, if not all, of the uh, decoders that are out there on the market. Uh, we've improved the Hyperlight lighting effects. Uh, those guys out there who know me know I like to put a lot of lights on our models, and so this was something that I had a few features that were uh, interesting that were important to us that we put into the model and, and you guys get to get the benefit of it. And we'll talk about some of those here in a little bit. Um, our FlexMap function mapping, uh, we'll get into more detail with this in another uh, webinar coming up, but we do also have some information on our YouTube channel. Uh, but FlexMap function mapping allows you to take any function and assign it to any button. It also allows you to automatically trigger sound lighting or other effects when you're moving in forward reverse or stopped in forward and reverse. And you can even map a, an effect to the emergency stop. Uh, so most DCC systems, it's a local command, which means it sends it to just your locomotive or your train that you're running. And if you press it multiple times, it'll shut down the layout. But so this way you can have an effect when you hit the emergency stop, it will trigger a lighting effect or a sound effect. Uh, we've improved the audio, uh, much louder audio. We've got a stronger amplifier on our entire decoder product line. And we've also had a lot of tools to help give you a little bit more control over how the sounds are playing back, uh, including an industry first high pass filter. Uh, seven band equalizer, just like we had in the original Tsunami, allows you to adjust the overall tone to enhance the speaker's strengths and minimize its weaknesses. Um, a fully adjustable reverb that you can do a small reverb uh, off an adjacent surface all the way to a heavy echo off a long distance surface. And then we've also got an alternate volume mixer where you can enable a function and it will set to a second set of volumes. So if you're having uh, loud audio for the club, but you want to be a little quieter at home, you can enable a function and it will switch to a different mixer. 
Now this is disabled out of the function mapping chart out of the factory, but it is there that you can add it in. And all of this stuff will go into detail and more with a uh, future webinar. For those of you guys who know, I model Missouri Pacific, so there's a little sneak peek at my uh, small little switching layout. So uh, I modeled primarily diesels, 1978, so this is of particular interest to me. So let's take a look here at Tsunami 2 sound selection. So first off, when we get the decoder, we put it in, and you're going to hear some default sounds play, but how do I customize the decoder to match the sounds of the model that I've installed it into? Well, on our website at soundtracks.com under the manuals tab, you're going to see the sound selection reference. And in this particular case, we've got the EMD-2 version pulled up and, and installed into this model here. So we're going to show you how easy this is to make the changes. So first off, CV120 is our air horn selection. And on that sheet, you're going to see a list of 44 different air horns labeled 0 through 43. And what this does is this allows you to go through the list and kind of look at it and see what you've got. All right, so let's unmute this guy. Now, the default air horn is a K3LA three chime, but we want to put the uh, M5, or I'm sorry, the M3 on this. So here's the default. Now, by simply changing CV120 to a value of 9, we can get our M3. Now even if we want to go so far as looking through the entire list here and we have an Auga Klaxon horn on option number 39, we can set CV120 to a value of 39 and we get the wonderful Now the next thing is you select your bell. Now this is stored in CV122. So when we turn on our bell, you're going to hear the EMD number two, but you're going to hear it at a medium fast ring rate. Now when you look at your chart, you're going to see a range next to each bell, and that bell is going to tell you, or I'm sorry, that range is going to tell you that this is the bell but recorded at different ring rates. And they have different resonances when the bell is hit, when depending on how fast. So and when you want to change the bell, you look at your list there and you're going to see a range. And the, slow, the lowest value is the slowest ring rate and the highest value is the fastest ring rate. So let's take, for example, EMD number 3. Let's take CV122 and we're going to set it to a value of 20 so you can hear the slowest rung bell. Now when I take CV122 now, and I'm going to set it to a value of 23, which is going to be the fastest ring rate for this particular bell. So you can kind of hear how that has changed. Now one of the other advantages of having railroaders on staff while we were designing this is that we got a railroader's perspective on the bell. Now when you're sitting up in the cab and the bell is ringing constantly, it becomes a somewhat of an annoying sound. Well with the Tsunami 2, you can actually set the bell to trigger automatically with the air horn. So when you go to your list, you're going to select your bell, and then you're going to add 128 to that number, and that's going to trigger the air horn to then also trigger the bell. So when we do this, we're going to go through and we're going to look at, let's use the modern Graham White electronic bell, a value of 36. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set CB122 to a value of 36, but now I'm going to add 128, and that's going to give me a value of 164. So now when I blow my horn, you'll hear that bell automatically trigger. Now it will ring as long as the time is set in CB50, I'm sorry, CB60, which is the crossing hold time. So as whatever you set that value to, 0 to 15, it's going to ring for that many seconds. Now having railroaders on staff, as I mentioned with the annoying sound, is when they were still doing their whistle signals, they were trying to do the whistle signal but more quickly so that they didn't trigger the bell. So when they hit the short horn, they were trying to tap that button quickly enough to get the horn to blow, but not long enough to get the relay to trigger to turn on the bell. So to do this during the design of the Tsunami 2, we went ahead and threw those guys a bone here. So when we blow the long horn on function 2, you hear the bell automatically trigger. But when I blow the short horn, you do not hear the bell. Now this is just one of the many uses of a railroading experience that we built into the Tsunami 2 sound selection. 
So when you blow your long horn, function two, you get the bell. When you blow your F9 grade crossing, you'll hear the bell. But when you press the F3 short horn, there's no bell. So that's one example of how real railroading experience made its way into the decoder. Um, other sound selections you have there, CV-124 gives you the ability to choose between different air compressors. Um, CV-125 allows you to select between an air dryer and a poppet valve. And I want to talk about this one. Uh, this is in a version 1.2 update that we've done. Uh, the original Tsunami 2 had the poppet valve, and that's that sound that you would hear. And in CV-125 now, we've added the ability to select an air dryer. And you can do that on more modern locomotives. So it's, it's set as the air dryer by default, but you can select CV-125. So if you're modeling an older locomotive, say an F7 or something like that, you can change CV-125 to now become the poppet valve. And then you can select couplers in CV-126. Um, I did miss accidentally to talk about the prime mover selection. So in CV-123, one of the most iconic sounds is, of course, the prime mover. Okay, now we're going to select the prime mover in CV-123. So for this locomotive right now, I've got this set up for the EMD 645E 12-cylinder turbo. Now, to make the CV adjustment, we're just going to change CV-123 to a value of zero, and in this case, we're going to hear our 12-cylinder 567. So once you've selected your prime mover, you can go through the list and adjust CV-123 and listen to each of the prime movers or go to do your research and pick one that you like or which one that matches your prototype. So looking at our list, we can go through and select any of these different prime movers. So for example, let's say we want to listen to the 20 cylinder. So we're going to go ahead and set CV-123 to a value of 5. And now you're going to hear that prime mover settle in. Now one of the other tools we've given you is a prime mover pitch shift. And this uses CV223. And it will adjust the pitch of the prime mover slightly up or slightly down. So this way you can have all of them, let's say for example these 20 cylinders, you can have a whole bunch of these in your fleet, but no two of them sound alike. Now this is over and above the equalizer and the reverb settings that we've given you as audio tools to adjust it. So to show this, I'm going to take CV223. And I'm going to set it to a value of zero. And what that's going to do is that's going to pitch shift down. I believe it's 10 cents. I don't remember the exact measurement, but check the user's guide. But it'll shift it down, so you should be able to hear the change right now. So you still have that 20-cylinder flavor, but you have a slightly different tone. Now I can take this CV and adjust it all the way up. So we're going to take it and raise it up to uh, the maximum. So you can kind of hear how it's pitch shifted around. Now we'll take it back to CV to a value of 128, which is in the middle, or no change. So you can hear subtle changes, but not drastic. But it's still enough that you hear the characteristic, but it gives you the ability to have unique sounds on each of your locomotives. So our next poll is going to be, with all of these sound selections that we've talked about, uh, and some that we haven't yet, uh, air horn selection, bell selection, prime mover selection, and so forth, how many different locomotive profiles do we have the ability to store in the diesel Tsunami, uh, Tsunami 2 product line? So with the next selection, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about hyperlights a little bit. And I'm going to move the camera over here to try to get a head-on view of our locomotive. And hyperlights, I talk about a lot of times with diesels because the hyperlights are different warnings that are designed to help draw a motorist's attention away from the road and to the giant locomotive that's about to hit them. So now with our hyperlights, we're going to go ahead and press zero to turn on the headlight. And then we're going to use function 24 
to turn on both ditch lights together. So this has been remapped so the function 24 turns on the FX3 and the FX4. Now I have those set up for alternating flashing ditch lights. So when I blow the horn using crossing logic, the lights will start to flash and they will continue to hold while they continue to flash for about a, many, a few seconds. And this is again set in CV60. And then we can adjust the flash rate in CV49. Now to kind of illustrate some of the different hyperlights that we can do, I'm going to take our headlight now and I'm going to turn it into a Mars light just to show you what it can do. So we're going to take CV49, we're going to set it to a value of 2 and you can kind of see that Mars light effect. Now one of the new hyperlight features that we've added in is what's called a constant dim and there's actually two of these, constant dim 1 and constant dim 2. And no, we're not talking about your model railroad buddies. So we're going to take CV49 right now, we're going to illustrate this. We're going to set it to a value of 19, which will be constant dim number 1. Now the way this works is CV61 then adjusts the brilliance. So I can take CV61 and right now let's go ahead and set it to a max value for full brightness of 255. So you can see how that light has changed. Well now let's take CV61 and we're going to set it down to say 50. And you can kind of see how that light has changed in brilliance. Now let's take CV61, we'll set it to 128, and it's about middle brightness. Now the reason this was done is because when you're doing your installation, this will make it a lot easier for you because you can pick one resistor value for all of your lights and then you can use CVs to adjust the brilliance. This is a great application for things like class lights or number boards, uh, truck lights, step lights, any of those other types of, of lights that you don't want to appear as bright as a headlight on your locomotive. So the next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about dynamic digital exhaust. And I'm going to move the camera back over here a little bit so we can see the locomotive. So our dynamic digital exhaust feature, and this is across our entire product line, and I'm gonna show you how it works, but there's a short calibration process, so the decoder knows how much power the motor itself is gonna use. When we're running our locomotive, it uses that as a reference to notch up or down the diesel engine uh, sound. Now, this is uh, outlined on our YouTube channel, so you can watch a couple of tutorials on how to set these CVs. Uh, you'll set it while the locomotive is running. Um, but the last two that are unique to diesels, or at least I address them more with diesels, is what's called attack time and release time. And these two CVs, uh, you want to set to a relatively high value so that the decoder, if, it, if the locomotive's coupler bump a little bit, the release time and attack time will not cause the diesel engines to notch up out of sync uh, because of a slight coupler bump, because it's taking longer to respond. So play with those values a little bit well uh, as well. One thing also to note is the dynamic digital exhaust is disabled on our diesel decoders by default. And part of the reason is, is because with all the different ranges of motors and drive lines and things like that, we couldn't find a good average value that would create a good experience out of the package. Uh, steam locomotives traditionally run by themselves. And so that setting on that one uh, can be kind of nominal. But with the diesels, they're kind of a little bit more uh, specific. And so the calibration process is kind of where that came from so that the locomotive is able to work for itself. So let's kind of hear what this is. Okay, so to show off the dynamic digital exhaust, we're gonna go ahead and get this guy moving here forward at about speed step four. So you hear the prime mover notching up and then you hear it settling back down. Now to simulate a heavier train, I'm gonna put my finger in front of the prime mover, or in front of the locomotive, I mean. And you hear that prime mover starting to notch up as it's working harder against my hand. Now, when I release, you're gonna hear that prime mover drop back down because now the load has been relieved and so now the locomotive is not working quite as hard. And then we'll bring it to a stop. So a couple other things we want to talk about with this. Uh, after you set the calibration for this, you'll want to go in and set CV114, uh, CV114. Uh, in this case, I recommend to start with a value of 47. And what this does is this sets it to 15 speed steps for auto notching. And that just kind of helps smooth out the, the notching a little bit more uh, so that that way your notching with multiple locomotives is more smooth and more uh, coordinated. Um, this also enables the auto start, and what the auto start does is it will initially trigger the, uh, 
prime mover sound to start up as soon as track power is applied. Uh, you can disable this. This is worth the value of 32. So out of this 47, if you want to manually start the prime mover up, you would just take the auto start out and set the value. Uh, the other one I like is to enable the interlock, which is plus the value of 16. And, and what the interlock does is it prevents you from running your diesel engine when the locomotive diesel engine is not running. It also prevents you from accidentally shutting down the prime mover while you're moving. And to do this, F5 and F6 are a manual override. So you have your dynamic digital exhaust, which will notch up based on what you're doing. But if you really want to override it and you don't think the DDE is ramping up enough, you can manually override it with the F5 and the F6. The best part about this is you still have the manual control. You never lose control of your locomotive by locking your throttle and allowing you to notch up the prime mover. So this gives you the best of both, both worlds. You have the auto notching and you have the dynamic digital exhaust, but then you do still also have the manual override. So one of the other cool features that we've added into Tsunami 2 uh, when it comes to braking. The original Tsunami had an F11 where you would apply F11, it would play the brake squeal sound effect. And it, you set a CV and you could have the locomotive stop. Well, in the Tsunami 2, we've taken that and gone one step farther. So F11 now becomes the brake application and F12 toggles between the two brake systems. You have the independent brake and the automatic or the train brake. The independent brake are the brakes that are actually on the locomotive, the, the uh, brake shoes that you'll see on the trucks. This is used for switching in the yard, hostling locomotives, or spotting cars and industries. Um, and then the automatic or the train brake uses the airline through the train line, and it will apply the brake shoes on the cars to help drag the train and drag the locomotives to a stop. Because if you were relying on the locomotive brakes to stop a train of thousands of tons, you'd have to change those brake shoes every time you stopped. And so the train brake helps distribute that braking effort across the entire train line. So the way this works is when F11 is turned on, the, you have the brake application. And F12, when it's off, the train you're in uh, independent brake mode. When F12 is on, you're now in automatic or train brake. Now, when you trigger F12 on and you go into train brake mode, the decoder will then increase the diesel engine prime mover and trigger the compressor sound to charge the train line. So you don't have to manipulate buttons to simulate that. All you're doing is turning on F12 and now you're gonna be in brakes, uh, in the train brakes. So let's take a listen to this. Let's play around with the, with the decoder and let's see how this works. So now let's unmute the prime mover here. Now with this, we're gonna go ahead and start moving forward at about speed step five. And then we'll go ahead and apply our independent brake. So the F11 is gonna be on. And you see the locomotive come to a stop quickly. Now I'm gonna change directions. We'll go back again, speed step five or six. We'll release our brake. Now we can cut the throttle and then we can use our brakes to stop the train where we need to. And we can feather it on and off as needed. Now let's say we're tied into the train now and now we're going to connect the airlines on the train and we're going to toggle into train brake mode. So now we're going to activate F12. We're going to turn F12 on. And what you're going to hear is you're going to hear the air compressor start to cycle as it's working to charge the train line. And you're also going to hear the prime mover notch up as it works to charge the train line faster. So we're going to press F12 right now. You hear the compressor start to cycle and you hear the train line change over to the automatic brakes. So this will run this way for about 30 seconds or so, but in the real world charging a train line takes about 10 to 15 minutes. But they, with things like fast clocks and, and other things, impatient model railroad or stuff like that, we went ahead and chose 30 seconds as a good compromise. So now once this is done, let's say we're ready to go, we can pull our train out. So we're going to blow our whistle signal. We're going to start to move. We'll say speed step 10. You hear the prime mover load up. Now we can release our brakes. Now we'll go ahead and cut the throttle, but now when we do our brake set, 
you're actually going to notice that it takes a little longer for the train to come to a stop. And that's because we're simulating the thousands of tons behind the train. The other thing you're going to notice is as I use my brakes more frequently, you're also going to hear the compressor cycle more frequently. So this shows another instance of where the sounds are interactive and not just playing randomly in the background. Now with our diesel Tsunami 2, we've actually implemented a third braking rate, which is in our, our dynamic brakes. Now with the original Tsunami, you would press the F4, it plays the dynamic brake sound effect, but you could also affect the prime mover where it would drop it to idle, typically EMD. Uh, some of the railroads specifically would then drop the prime mover to notch four, and the idea was to keep the traction motor blowers running. Uh, and then in some cases, GE and Alco, the fans for the dynamic brakes were mechanically driven off of the crankshaft, so it would not notch up to notch eight. Where the Tsunami 2 gives you a little bit more operation is that you have high and low dynamic brake application. So the first press of the F4 of the dynamic brakes will actually trigger the sound effect of the dynamic brakes and adjust your prime mover accordingly as you've set in CV114. A second press of the dynamic brakes sound, uh, in the F4 will then trigger dynamic brake high and will now actually implement a third braking rate that will bring your train down to about seven to 10 miles an hour. In the real world, dynamic braking will never actually stop your locomotive. And so this is a great way to have your sound effect and your operation match more closely with what you're doing. Now, this is a separate braking rate set in CB116. And because of space, we're not going to demonstrate it here. But we do have a great video that we shot at our friend, our late friend, Jim Richards layout on our YouTube channel that you can see the link there below. And we'll also link it in the description on our YouTube channel when we post this uh, webinar up there. So some of the other sounds that we've got in there, head end power, uh, also known as HEP on function 16. What this will do is this will artificially increase the diesel engine RPM up. And the idea behind it was to generate extra electrical energy um, for keeping the passenger train powered. And so the F40 pH is there illustrated were known as little screamers uh, because they would sit at the depot, but they'd be in notch eight. Uh, more recent locomotives that you see with Amtrak, such as the GE P42s and the AMD 103s, uh, GE figured out that they don't need to be in notch eight, that you can also be in notch six in this case to maintain enough electrical energy. But the where the really cool effect is, is that when the dynamic digital exhaust takes over and you're in head-end power, with the P42, it will notch up to eight and back down to six, but never below six when you're in head-end power. Now, also with the Tsunami 2, we have the ability for a steam generator on function 20, but you can also switch between a steam generator or a separate head-end power pup motor on some of the more modern locomotives, like the F59 PHI will have a separate diesel engine designed strictly for electrical generation for the passenger train. And so in CV112, you can select between the steam generator or pup motor. Uh, on our diesel locomotive, we've also hired now Fireman Ed, and Fireman Ed has a few tasks that you'll see, including pneumatic lubricators. Uh, you can adjust the air conditioning and the also all popular sound of the toilet flush. Now, all of these sounds, you can adjust the probability on how frequently they come out. So if you're running in uh, Arizona in the summer, you can have that air conditioning cycling on quite a bit. But if you're modeling, you know, say up in the Northeast in the wintertime, you can have it come on very, very rarely. Um, you can also adjust the volumes for each of those sounds so you can determine how prominent they are. Uh, one of the other ones, um, I've been to a few operating layouts where they'll have a, a in uh, layout fueling rack where you actually have to stop and take on fuel. So with the activation of function 17, you can trigger that sound effect of taking on fuel. Now there is a lot more. This is an overview. So this is just to kind of highlight some cool features that we've built into it. So next thing we're going to do is reveal our poll. So we've got our question, how many actual sounds are, uh, sound profiles are we able to build with Diesel Tsunami 2? And so with that, the actual correct answer is 19,430,400. And the way I came up with that is on our Diesel Tsunami 2s, we have 44 different air horns to choose from, 50 different bell selections, uh, 46 prime mover choices, of, across the five decoders, two EMD, a GE, and Alco, and then the Land of Misfit toys known as the Baldwin and others. Uh, we have four compressor choices. We can select between the air dryer and the poppet valve. Uh, we have four passenger mode 
uh, like we just talked about with the steam generator and the HEP pup motors, uh, dynamic brake versus non-dynamic braking, and three coupler sounds. So that's where that number comes from. Um, looking at our function mapping chart, you're going to see, if, for those of you guys who are here for the steam, you're going to see a lot of similarities. Um, F5, F6, as we talked about, is our, our notch up and down, but it also doubles as our start up and shut down. Um, F11 is our brake application. F12 is our train line brake. Um, we also have F10 as a straight to eight. So if you're doing switching, you can hit the F10, run the diesel engine straight up to notch eight, and then uh, run it back and forth, and then uh, turn it on and off as needed. Um, also a new one is F19, which is a straight to idle. So if you want to coast into a depot uh, and you, your DDE doesn't go all the way down um, like you'd want, you can force it straight to idle. Um, F18 general servicing, uh, some other things like that. Uh, and then we've also moved the lights to the higher functions. And part of the reason is to give you single button presses for more of the operation stuff that you're doing with the locomotive while you're running, whereas lights traditionally you turn them on once and leave them. Okay, so now we're going to do a little demonstration here of using the decoder in an operating scenario. We're going to do a brief overview. So first thing, we're going to do some switching. We're going to move some cars around. So we've got to move in reverse here to pick up our cars. And we can use our brakes, toggle the brakes to make sure we pick up our car. Oh, we didn't get it. So let's go back and do it again. Let's make sure we got it this time. We'll use a little mag magic here. All right, we got our car. Now we're gonna move forward a little bit. Now let's say we've got to switch tracks. We've got to pick up another car. Do the same thing. We'll go back to the other track. We'll pick up the other cars. And then here's where we can use our brakes to feather until we're tied in. So now let's say we're tied in. Now we're going to turn on F12 to toggle our train brake. You're going to hear the prime mover cycle faster and notch up to turn the compressor faster. And then once this is done, we check our car cards, we double check everything, make sure our train's ready to go. We put the cards in order to make sure we know where our train is going. And then once we're ready to go, we've got our clear signals. Now we're going to blow our whistle signal. Turn on the bell. And start notch one our speed step one we're going to release the brakes and we start out at speed step one so we can pull the couplers tight and make sure we release the slack out of the train and once we have that we can then get going and head on the way when we need to set our brakes you'll hear the air reduction in the cab now what's a really cool effect is once you get sound car and the rolling stock, you can hear that all synchronized together. So you'll hear the air reduction in the locomotive, but you'll hear the squeal coming out of the cars. Be sure to check out our next webinar, which will be a more detailed overview of operations using Soundtracks products. And then we'll start getting into the nuts and bolts of how the decoder operates. Sign up for the customer newsletter. Um, also, if you are one of our uh, retail partners and you're not getting our newsletters, please send us an email, let us know so we can update the, your email addresses or if any of that's changed. Um, but if you're participating here and you're not already signed up to the newsletter, uh, you can sign up on our website. Also, we've added some uh, social media here in our Instagram, which is a brand new channel that we started. Uh, Facebook, we've been posting short little tutorial videos, quick little tips, hints. Uh, YouTube, we've been posting videos every week highlighting a specific feature. Uh, this will be archived on our YouTube channel as well. 
And then Twitter, occasionally we use that mostly for announcements of shows and stuff like that. So be sure to follow us on all of those. And then for the clinic presentation, uh, the PowerPoint that you're watching here, we'll put that up on the link uh, there at soundtracks.com slash webinars.